And my name is Philip Martin. I am the co-owner of Philip Martin Gallery here in Los Angeles and really delighted to have an opportunity today to talk to uh, Rima Galoom about her work. Um, it usually takes just a second for people to come into the webinar. So we'll just give people, oh, nice. We have a nice kind of crowd coming in. So just give people a second to get in. Okay, so my name is Philip Martin and I am the co-owner of Philip Martin Gallery here in Los Angeles with uh, my partner, Portia Hine. And I hope you've had a chance to um, meet Portia either here in the gallery in our new location in Glassell Park or at the fairs. Uh, if you have any questions about any of the work that you see today, just you know, feel free to send me an email. Um, we really appreciate everybody taking the time to come to the webinar today. Um, it's an intense time in the world. I hope people's loved ones are safe. And um, I really appreciate everyone taking the time to talk about uh, talk about the art today, which is really exciting. So Rima, I am thrilled to have the chance to talk to you about your solo show here, uh, Flower Moon Eclipse. Do um, you want to start by talking about some of your painting titles, for example? Uh, they're very evocative. Sure. Thanks, Philip, for doing this with me. And thanks for everyone um, to everyone who's here. You know, it's a a challenging time too, um, so I'm grateful. Um, yeah, Flower Moon Eclipse, the title, came from a painting actually that is included in the show. And <clears throat> I was the flower moon, I don't know if you know what a flower moon is, I but don't. it's a spring moon, it's a spring mm -hmm. full moon. Mm -hmm. And so when I made that painting, it was in May, mm -hmm. or when I completed it, it was the spring. And so it um, it's often references, you know, a spring bloom, it's, um, and, I like the combination of flower, moon, and eclipse because eclipse all, often incorporates shadow and mm -hmm. light. Mm -hmm. And so it just seems sort of poetic. I, my titles just happen after I make something. I don't necessarily know what anything is. I just kind of look at the painting and it sort of evokes a sort of feeling. And, uh -huh. and that's kind of where that come from, uh, came from or they come from. And so the title of the show kind of felt like these paintings all sort of incorporate sort of dark and light and there's this contrast of elements within mm -hmm. each painting that sort of then I don't know for me reference or the title sort of references as well yeah there's a lot to talk about there um I don't know uh, quite where to start but I was wondering I mean so are you saying that in terms of say experiencing your paintings and there's a lot of energy in the work and we talked about that a little bit in the press release you're a reiki uh practitioner you're also a vipassana meditator um do you think the titles come kind of i don't want to make more of it than it is but do they kind of come to you as in terms of just this interaction with the energy of the painting itself exactly like yeah i don't i mean even my paintings are so intuitive I mean, mm -hmm. I never have a plan. And so they kind of direct me the process of building up the surface mm -hmm. um, with thin layers of paint and hand sanding. There's an energy that's in the surface itself mm -hmm. that I think kind of comes alive and mm -hmm. or comes to, into being sort of. And so that's where the title titles come from as well. It's it's I'm often referencing in titles either some sort of phenomenon uh, maybe, maybe there's like a natural phenomenon. It could be like, you know, this painting here, um, mm -hmm. or a song. So this painting here is called when I awake, I will see your light. And that mm -hmm. actually comes from a chant by Paramahasa Yogananda. Okay. And so when I made this painting, um, I had, I knew that it was going to be, um, you know, uh included in a sh in the show at Fort the Forest Lawn Museum. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that's on view right now. Yeah, and um it's so funny because I used to go uh to the Self-Realization Fellowship. Uh -huh. Um the grounds, the one in Malibu and uh -huh. there's one in Hollywood yep. with when, with my sister and um and I hadn't been there for a really long time. And just when I was invited to do the show, uh -huh. I was in another exhibition with uh -huh. my friend um, who my friend Ross Simonini curated. Uh -huh. And he had said that he had they'd gone to the self-realization fellowship. And uh -huh. I was like, oh yeah, I should go there. I just had this, an autobi uh, autobiography of a yogi was like 
yeah. a very important book to me when I was in high school. Yeah. And I, I, so I ended up rereading it. I went to the self-realization fellowship. Yeah. And then I realized I was Googling. I was just looking him up, doing some research and realized he was buried at the Forest Lawn Museum. Uh, so okay. then I, okay, go <laughs> ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, so my mind is just being very blown right now. I know that we have a responsibility to the view, to the viewers to tell them about, to talk about the babies, but you and I have never discussed this. I did an independent study on Yogananda in college. I studied that book for a semester. Oh my God. <laughs> so, yeah, we could do, we could talk about that. We need to talk about this because, okay. So that. then, so then I was like, there's something here. So then I went and visited his mm. mausoleum at the Forest Incredible. Lawn I had no, I, I can see that from my house. I'm stunned that, uh, yeah, okay. And yeah. so then I went there and uh, I was so inspired uh -huh. by the space. And I was mm. so in shock because another random, I mean, there's so many random coincidences that often get <laughs> into the work that I don't yeah. talk about. But yeah. but my sister used to live in front of the, that cemetery and you, it was like sort of her backyard my sister Gina she lives with uh, in, so what we're talking in about for people who are not Angelinos <laughs> is um there is a massive massive cemetery called Forest Lawn that is very omnipresent in east uh in the in neighborhoods like Eagle Rock or Glendale or Atwater you can see it from many different places um but it's interesting because it's kind of a uh uh it's the way cemeteries are, these massive amounts of space that somehow you can't quite locate almost, and you don't know, are they public or are they private? And then it's very interesting when I'm talking with real Angelinos like like Rima, um, just like their history with the place over time. It has a very significant museum that, uh, that uh, Rima's work is at. They have what was one of the largest paintings in LA. Well, it's one of the, I don't mean- In the world, in, in the, the world. world one time. So in the 1950s, people like Carl Chang or 60s, they would go there on pilgrimages, like as, as school kids. And then now you talk. And I think Michael Jackson is buried there. Yeah, Michael Jackson. <laughs> anyway, sorry, is I'm getting there. off the mark, but just to tell people what Forest Lawn is. So there yeah. you're in this place and you go into this museum and there's like literally a bourgeois, like <laughs> right in the front with like all of these, you know, because they're of that era. And then you're in this really remarkable show. So please continue my apologies. Well, yeah. So anyway, I didn't. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I hadn't I hadn't actually visited this museum. I've had yeah. vi visited the grounds right. many times. That's amazing. And so so it was all of this stuff. And I'm like, oh, OK. And there are these beautiful stained glass windows in wow. in the mausoleum. And wow. I remembered the painting that I made that was the same height. So that painting is 102 by 72 inches. Right. was called Night Prayer that was in your exhibition last yeah, yeah. year. Right. And so they were, they so were, a, okay. All right, they were related. Ahead, yeah. So they're uh -huh. related paintings. Wow. And so I was really thinking about the body and the height and, yeah. and, and so the chant, I, I listen to chanting a lot when I paint. Yeah. And, uh -huh. um, and so that just came out of the title just came out of a chant that was, um, a Paramahasa Yogananda chant that, that is, then, who is also buried. It was sort of a way to honor him in a way. <laughs> I can't believe it. I really <laughs> cannot believe it. Okay. Um, all right. Try to, to orient the viewers. Let's orient the viewers. So, tell you know, when we're looking at a painting like this, um, you know, we have these big kind of marks that we can clearly, you know, see that are sweeping across the canvas. We have the uh, side uh, parts here. Um, do you want to just orient the, can the viewers a little bit to sort of, physically how you you make your paintings and, and just how we came to this, you know, while we're chanting, as we just discussed. <laughs> totally. This actually, this painting is actually the namesake of the show. This is Flower yeah. Moon Eclipse. Thank you. Um, so the paintings all start on the floor. So mm -hmm. I prop them up on blocks mm -hmm. and I, I pour um, acrylic gouache, which is like an aqueous paint that's mm -hmm. similar to acrylic. Um, and I, I actually uh, dilute it a lot and I use various methods of um, painting, like pouring, uh, I, I use, I'm sorry, buckets to pour the paint, spray bottles, squeeze bottles. So th in a way they're, they're a lot like watercolor, but this very similar to a drawing practice, you know, uh -huh. I, I'm, I'm moving the, and they're very physical at that point. Cause I'm manipulating the canvas, moving it around so that the pores drip in different ways. Mm -hmm. And, and that, and once it settles, the paint settles and dries, which is fairly quickly in, in comparison to the next stage of the painting. Mm -hmm. I prop them up on the wall and there's this ground. 
that is made up of all these different kinds of marks and colors. Um, and that becomes sort of the structure for the painting. Mm -hmm. So I rely on those colors and the marks. Sometimes there are these kind of linear grids or mm -hmm. um, just lines that I'm kind mm -hmm. of pushing up against or mm -hmm. using as a, so, something to work against. And mm -hmm. so when I prop them up on the wall, I start working with really thin layers of oil paint. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> and when I say thin, I mean very little paint. I'm either dry brushing, which is scumbling, or I'm glazing <clears throat> with a little bit of medium. Excuse me. <clears throat> and then I'm once that's dry, I'm hand sanding the surface. And so this part, so the first part of the process is very fast mm -hmm. in the sense that there's a real speed to it. Like the mm -hmm. way that I'm pouring, it's very expressive. The, there's, there's splatters. You can kind of get a sense of the speed. Yeah. And then it's contrasted by these really thin layers of paint that are sanded. And so that those layers get um, sort of embedded into the surface of the painting. Mm -hmm. And that history is what sort of informs the next move. And mm -hmm. so I think a lot about so I don't know what they're going to be. They kind of guide me. It's really, mm -hmm. and this is kind of where the, I think the, the practice of meditation and my interest in energy comes mm -hmm. through because it's really about listening to the painting and building it up sort of in a very geological way. So there's this additive and subtractive approach that kind of then emerges kind of like mm -hmm. a crystal, mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of how I think about it. And when I, I don't know that they're done until they're sort of evoking, obviously, a feeling or feelings. There's mm -hmm. so often, I, I think a lot about a transformation that happens within a painting, mm -hmm. as well as a transformation that can happen while looking at the painting. And yes. so they're often divided into different parts, like, yeah. like this one, for example, this is called Arrival. Mm -hmm. And um, there's this sort of, these are kind of like striations of color that are moving from left to right. And mm -hmm. then it opens up into this kind of like, like kind of waterfall yeah. cloud misty yeah. space. Yeah. And, and that to me is what I'm really interested in is creating these kind of contrasts, these elements within a painting that push up against one another, but then also can coexist. Yeah. Um, and the tension between the poor like from underneath, you can see there's sort of this active, it's activated because there's this yeah. core that's kind yeah. of um, playing with or kind of coexisting with these other kinds of marks, like mm -hmm. other, whether it's a color field or the drips, you can kind of mm -hmm. see like that's a, that's a kind of speed that's mm -hmm. then kind of um, um, uh, incorporated mm -hmm. uh, alongside these other layers. And so yeah. the layers, the layering is really important. Um, yeah. I want the paintings to feel like I, I liken it a lot to my practice as a Vipassana meditator. Yep. Um, I think a lot about like sensations in the body um, mm -hmm. and, and so how they can kind of coexist. This kind of is a little abstract, but yep. like, but from a painterly perspective it's, too, I, like how something can, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, you, 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 you go ahead and then I can make my point. I'm, I, I just meant like when something can kind of be two things at once or multiple mm -hmm. things at once and, yeah. and then that can kind of live, they can kind of coexist with one another, like mm -hmm. something being really dense, the space being very dense, but also very atmospheric and ethereal. Yeah. Um, or a th or thin, but also thick, you know, yeah. or viscous, but, but atmospheric, you know, all of these yeah. qualities um, are very similar to qualities that you, one can kind of perceive um, in an experience, a human yeah. experience, I guess. Yeah. Well, it's very interesting what you're saying, because um, you were in a group show called the holographic principle. Um, I, titled that show after uh an idea in um in in quant sort of cosmology that that's really interesting with regard to black holes and it it was the show is about abstraction but it was really interesting like in doing the show i almost feel like uh well i do feel like i've lost my sense of what abstraction is <laughs> and um 
<laughs> Meaning that like, I mean, I, I know what abstraction is, but I'm I'm kind of pleased that right, right now, I kind of feel like I don't know what abstraction is. Um, I'm gonna say, I don't know. And so I'm very much enjoying reopening this, um, reopening what this, what what that what that is at this moment in my like 51 year old life of having shown art for like you know hunt you know for 20 plus years and um there's something with paul clay that i've been mentioning because it's been on my mind uh where people are pointing out you know that he's he's theoretically a surrealist but this interesting critic that i read was like you know no, he's actually the most objective artist out there he's dealing with very objective physical things in his work and I don't know if that's if you have any response to that with regard to sort of, um, ab, you know, abstraction in your own work, the physicality. And I, the last thing I might say is, you know, and this is just me, maybe it's helpful to the audience. Maybe there's people that know Vipassana really well. I don't know Vipassana very well because my experience was Zen, which is, you know, not exactly the same. But my understanding of Vipassana is that you go down your body, you know, think like focusing on the on the experience of different parts of it so it's very physical and you do this over days and of course what's more physical than making a painting what's more physical than standing in front of a painting what's more physical than 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 having that that energy so that's all any response to any of those things that i just said yeah no i mean i, I well in terms of abstraction i mean i think that's why i'm so interested in it i mean as mm -hmm. somebody who has always toggled between sort of ob observational painting and mm -hmm. for lack of a better term abstraction i think yeah. that like it's there's a space um i think that opens things it uh, it opens things up to yeah. feeling mm -hmm. and i think my paintings in particular are so much about um surface and color yes. and how those things sort of can kind of congeal or mm -hmm. work with one another mm -hmm. to create something that mimics some, something familiar you mm -hmm. know like an experience and so mm -hmm. yeah that's um yeah like I think you know for a long time and I've mentioned this before I used to work observationally and then abstractly mm -hmm. and I would I would um in ex exhibit that work together you mm -hmm. know and um and it was almost like more about translation. And I still mm -hmm. feel like my work is about translation. It's about mm -hmm. synthesizing an experience mm -hmm. and without the limitations of this or that. It's more about this kind of in-between space. I mm -hmm. love the way Buddhists talk about, Taoists talk about spaciousness. Yep. And even in Reiki, you know, it's like this, it's, they're all, we're always talking about Reiki, this like universal spirit. Mm -hmm. and energy and that's I think that's why I love abstraction so much is because I'm able to actually create energy or mm -hmm. or paint uh what feels like something versus what looks like something right and um I guess does that answer your question no I mean it gets into a lot of things I would just we can you know also on the website I, I put for a lot of people if you don't know what reiki is there's just a paragraph from the cleveland clinic which i think is helpful um because they just discuss in a medical context what it is but they point out that the word one one part of the word reiki is ki which could be chi so that for people that might be experiencing familiar with things like tai chi or acupuncture um you know this is a, a fundamental concept to chinese medicine as i understand it though i i'm not an expert um yeah, that makes a lot of sense because, of course, that's, I think, the thing about your work. And it actually is, an, I don't know if this is a next kind of question, is that I, I do, what's interesting is your works relate to one another. So there's an instinct on my part, knowing how other people might work, to think that you might say work in series. But I think that's actually like the absolute opposite of what you do in a certain sense, because you're, it's about being absolutely present. It, there's no thought about any other painting that's ever existed. Does that, is that, a nutty thing. There's no, there isn't. No, you're right. And actually, mm -hmm. for a long time, they're very nonlinear. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've been actually trying, as an exercise, uh -huh. to to combine or to create more continuity between them. Because for a long time, <laughs> they were these singular en entities. They had their own palette, their own logic. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, but they but they felt like me. You know, yeah. like you knew yeah. that they were mine. Yeah. But and so I. 
um, I've been trying to, to do that where there is this sort of language that's being either scaled up or scaled down yeah. within each painting, depending on the size of the painting. I mean, I use the same size brushes for mm -hmm. my large paintings and my small paintings oh, interesting. as a way to also create that kind yeah. of, and I've played with different ways. I mean, I've done, you know, in the past, I've made small paintings with really tiny brushes to kind of evoke or try to make them feel larger. But I like that I'm always interested in the micro and the macro, like mm -hmm. how one thing, a smaller space can exist in a larger space or, yeah. or scale, like Howard Hodgkin would always talk about scale, like his small yeah. paintings feel large, you know, yeah. and, or vice versa and trying yeah. to kind of play with that within mm -hmm. the works. Yeah. Well, it's interesting also, um, I have two questions, two things I want, <laughs> I want to ask. I want to ask you about Emma Coons and the idea of, um, cause you, you pointed her out to me, um, and the idea that she had that in the unfolding of her works, a person would experience a physical kind of unfolding and a kind of unhealing, uh, healing. Does that resonate with you? Oh yeah. I mean, Emma Coons, I mentioned to you that, that, you I didn't know, know who she was. I'm sure the audience probably does. <clears throat> this is a Swiss artist. That's what thirties, I guess. Um, she, late 19th century to so contiguous with Hilma off Hilma off Clint, but didn't know each other. Agnes Pelton or something and, like that. Yeah, yeah. There, uh, so I was initially introduced to her work through uh, when I was an undergrad um, mm -hmm. through a show called Three Times Abstraction that was initially at the Drawing Center that then right. moved right. to the Santa Monica Museum of Art. Right. But at right. that time, I was just delving in. Um, I was I was doing transcendental meditation and um, and I was making these kind of abstract landscape paintings and making med meditation drawings. And after mm -hmm. seeing that work, I I was like, oh, yeah this is okay. Like I'm onto something here. I feel yeah. like there's, there's something about my life that yeah. has to go into the work. And I've yeah. always been invested. If you know me well, you know that I'm always taking classes on various different healing modalities. I practice uh, Tai Chi. I love yoga. I do all these things. And I, yeah. I'm constantly like engaged in, in, in this stuff. Yeah. And so when I, and so I feel like now at this moment, they've kind of come together where I feel more comfortable talking about it. Yeah. But the space in which I make my paintings, like Hilma, is very sacred. Like, I think a lot about um, uh, preparation. Yeah. In Reiki, there's always... And, and also, you know, I, 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 I've trained as a meditation teacher also... Um, a few years, a year and a half ago yeah. as well. But there's this preparation for Reiki that um, I think a lot about, or preparation, you think about preparing your soil. I, I read that yeah. recently in a book about Reiki. Um, I prepare before, I prepare my space before yeah. I make my paintings. Like yeah. there's so much ritual that I don't necessarily need to talk about. But if you know yeah. me, you know that I'm, I meditate before my paint, before I paint, I clean before I paint. I, um, I do various things before I paint every single session. Yeah. And, um, and that's part of my own work. Um, yeah. and I always want to, so I always want to be sort of open hearted in the studio and really yeah. give the time to the painting and be yeah. a, an active listener and be very present so yeah all of that work goes into the painting and I give my paintings Reiki yeah so I want that to feel I, I, like it doesn't matter if it like Emma Coons had a more of an intention she would use a pendulum to mm -hmm. make her paintings and she would ask serious questions about what is going on in the world and she would try to heal her patients. She'd make these yeah. drawings, you know? Yeah. And I, I don't necessarily have that direct intention, but I do feel like I want my paintings to be a source of, I want there to be contemplation around them. And I definitely want the energy that I'm putting into them to be reflected back out, you know? Um, it's just very fascinating for me because, you know, I think your phrase active listening is really interesting. I mean, that is at the heart of any painter you know, regardless of what you're doing, you, you're always <clears throat> interacting with this object. And then I think to give it <clears throat> the way you're giving it 
clothing in, in this way, uh, clothing is not the right word, but the way you're, well, just say energy, giving it energy in a way that really makes sense to me, like in this very deep internal way. Um, it's just really, it's like, I'm really, I'm just so, I feel like, uh, yeah, this is going to be the web. <laughs> I don't know if they were not even close to answering the questions that I want. That we know. <laughs> I want to go. I know. I want to dive deep into this stuff because yeah, I mean, it's for me, what happened me. in school was that you know I I did uh, East Asian religions as an undergraduate, but then you're studying something in school that's you know a lived experience, and then you're in an academic thing and painting. I was like, well, this is meditative. And so I think that was a big part of it. And so I've always conjoined those things. And I think there's a real joy. Also, I would mention, you know, in terms of where the world is, in terms of really taking the time to be compassionate with ourselves, be compassionate with others, really hear one another, um, you know, and I think the way that painting can do that and art can really do that in this direct way is really something that is, I don't know, I, I'm really deep in thinking about about that right now. So anyway, you know. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's it's important. <laughs> it, no, and I appreciate that. And I appreciate talking to you about it because I, I think we need healing and I'm leaning into it even more, especially yeah, now. Totally. Um, and you know, I remember during the pandemic, I, I did a talk at SUNY Purchase. It was a public lecture. And mm -hmm. I it was the first time publicly that I talked yeah. about being a Reiki practitioner mm -hmm. and meditate and at that and a meditation. Was that nerve practitioner. wracking for you? I think in acad and in in school, um in yeah. grad not in undergrad, I was very supported, but when I went to grad school and I was very invested in this stuff, but also yeah. going through my own I my my sister had passed away, so I was really grieving and processing. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, my work became a walking meditation. I mean, that's yeah. how I arrived at my paintings at that time through this yeah. lens. Yeah. And I felt shut down initially yeah. um, because, you know, it was very, the, the theory that was very um, uh, acceptable was Western yeah. um, philosophy. And I was very engaged in Eastern philosophy. And, um, but it was good for me to dive into all of that and be yeah. able to defend it but i think i was shut down because i was even the word intuitive was a bad word when i was yeah, in right. grad school yeah um but but i i kind of over time realized especially during the pandemic i felt like we need to heal you know like yeah. this is it's okay and honestly when i get when i when i talked about that stuff um yeah. in that talk yeah, I received from the faculty, um, the host and the students yeah. grads. There was it was a public lecture that it was their favorite, or it, <laughs> that they really appreciated. Yeah, that I talked about those things. Yeah. That I talked about healing in particular. Yeah, um, because it was it was needed. I mean, we were yeah. all suffering collectively at yeah. that time, and I yeah. think we're all suffering collectively right now. And I yeah. think um, healing and painting and being engaged in yeah. other things too is important. And so yeah. I'm glad that, you know, I, I'm leaning into it. I'm glad. Well, that I think about again, you know, um, there's a lot of reasons why people, um, I don't want to say threatened. Cause I don't, I don't want to put that on people that somehow they feel threatened, but I think, I think people don't always, they don't feel included maybe because maybe they feel like this is something they don't understand or, or whatever. And they might have ideas about that. And I think trying to, I think that's, what's interesting too, in this conversation is, you know, I think it's interesting to talk about things and to make, and to really just try to make them very logical and very clear, you know, and very, cause it's, it's not actually very complicated what you're describing at all. It's like literally completely un uncomplicated <laughs> and, I know. and, it, <laughs> um, and it's a real, um, it's a really interesting, uh, conversation that's natural to making the art art object that an artist has. I mean, you know, what we're talking about individuality, we're talking about expressionism where, you know, people have been making tantric drawings for who knows how long, like it's a, this, is, I mean, this is what art making is. And so, um, 
I don't know. It was kind of interesting. I think that was one thing I did in the press release as I um, included the famous Bruce Nauman quote about oh. stick truths. And I think it's interesting because, you know, Bruce Nauman is an amazing artist. And so there are those people that might read that and be like, well, Bruce, Con Bruce, uh, Bruce Nauman would say being ironic. He wasn't being literal about that. But then what uh, do we, do we really do we know? know that? Uh, right. I'm not so sure that he was actually, because that is what people do. So I don't know. I yeah. Feel, yeah. Uh, I mean, I feel like art, being an artist and the studio is so sacred and I you think, are, I, it's a I think true a great word for, for it. I know it's threatening. It could not be threatening, but it's very, I guess, loaded. It brings up a lot of stuff. And I understand if it's too much in some sense, but, um, but I think it's true. Like taking that, that really seriously is an important, really important thing to do if you're going to spend this much time making paintings. If you're going to, yeah. And actually it's like how you treat your studio and your yep. life is how you treat others. And yeah. um, I feel like there's a real correlation and I want to live yeah. my, yeah, I want to live my life in the studio the way that I live my life out of the studio, which yeah. is in a sacred way, you yeah. know? Um, yeah. Well, it's really a privilege to be able to show the work and have the conversation with you. I really appreciate it so much. And um, I, we're pretty much wrapped up. I don't know if there's anything that you might have liked to say say that we didn't say. I did want to come back to this one just because this one has always struck me in terms of compositionally, this band across the bottom. And I was just curious how that came about. Like, how, why is that band there or how? Um, so this was a, a like sort of a breakthrough painting Great for me. Painting. Uh, really good. Um, it kind of led me into this full prismatic yes. oh, yes, rainbow palette. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, this painting is called Entrance. And mm -hmm. it was the first painting of a series of really large horizontal paintings um, that I made in this sort of vein. But um, as I was making the painting, so usually I don't know what it's going to be, but because the pore in this painting was prismatic from the beginning, it was, I, it was literally laid out in a rainbow, you know, mm -hmm. like warm to cool. Yeah. Um, as I started making it, these um, obviously this kind of grid structure started appearing and it felt too same democratic in yeah. a way. And I and I just thought, how can I make this kind of more discordant and scale up some of that language in the foreground? Yeah. So it was really an intuitive thing. But I realized, like, I needed to break this up in the, sort of a very weird, yeah. unconventional way, and which yeah. is why I decided to do that and it was really just mimicking those that sort of or there's like a horizontal there, there's sort of horizontal bands that are smaller above it yeah. and below it yeah and so it, it it was a decision that felt like made sense at the time and so I tried it initially and I was like oh maybe that's not working and then I I kind of layered again another kind of layer of color on each in each segment yeah. and then I was like that's weird yeah that is really weird in a good way yeah, and it yeah. made me un it made me uncomfortable which is why yeah. i left it there yeah because it kind of almost doesn't make sense and but it needs it yeah i i mean in person i mean there's just something about it 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 uh yeah the the solidity of it kind of and it and what it does calls to you in this really deep way i just i can't when you're looking at the painting and these are very slow paintings as i as i've mentioned before in terms of they're a moment for people that really like you get out of them what you put into them in terms of real dedicated looking and and being and being open to kind of having these sensory experiences and stuff. It's they're quite remarkable. So um, yeah. is there anything we might like to say that we haven't said yet or um, all good? <laughs> Yeah, I think so. I think we covered it all. I mean, there's all right. a lot we could talk about, but oh, yeah. yeah, so we could clearly be here for hours. <laughs> um, okay, so I just uh, want to say that. Uh, okay, wait a minute. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, cool. We have a nice uh, a nice comment from someone that's uh, very excited that you um, shared your studio today and talked a little bit about Hodgkins and stuff. So that's awesome. We really appreciate uh, all the viewers. It's such a delight to uh, have an opportunity to uh, interact with everyone. Rima, thank you so much for um, for taking the time to talk to us about your work. It's really a, a privilege and pleasure to show it. Uh, we're going to be including Rima's work in a group show that's coming up this um, 
spring here at the gallery, a solo show next year. We have some art fair plans and it's just really exciting to be, to be working with you. And there are there, we did do a previous um, interview that's there. There's some, there's some nice interviews with Rima online and some stuff on our website. So anything that you need, or if you have questions, you know, just, just email me anytime. Rima, thank you so much for, for joining me today. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. This is great. Thank you. Have everyone. a great day. Okay. Bye. Talk to you later.